Welcome to the Sebas Supercut, a consolidated version of every video I've made that covers his lore. These are videos from quite a few years ago, so please bear with the awkward narration and out-of-date editing style. Let's get started. It's time to focus our attention on the head butler of Nazrik and the commander of the Pleiades Six Sisters, Sebas Chin. But I'm sure you already knew that. So let's do as we usually do and find out who exactly is Sebas, the Iron Butler, by looking at everything from his lore and creation to all the external elements that influence his character. As the head butler, Sebas is effectively in charge of all the male servants of Nazarick, like the assistant butler Eclair 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 and his ten man servants. By contrast, Pestonia S. Wanko is the head maid in charge of the 41 homunculus maids. Presumably, Sebas' duties as head butler entail coordinating with the maids, specifically the head maid Pistonia, in scheduling and assigning the 52 plus underlings they have between them to ensure that the 9th and 10th floors of the guild were well kept and cleaned as Nazarick's standards demanded. But after Pistonia was placed into confinement, Sebas took over what would have been her role in training Suare to become a proper duty maid of Nazarick. This suggests that there is enough overlap between his specialties as head butler and Pistonia's specialty as head maid, since he could train Suare to the exacting standards demanded of the homunculus maids of Nazarick. Now, I could go over all the tasks and responsibilities that the homunculus maids have, but I think I'll save that for a video dedicated to Nazarick itself. For now, I think it's best to just know that they were responsible for cleaning and maintaining the throne room, its connecting hallways, each individual room of the Supreme Ones, and the guest rooms, day in and day out. Although Sebas does help to oversee them, his primary duty is not to serve drinks or clean Nazarick. Remember, he is also the commander of the combat maids, and as such, is skilled at both combat and maid-like duties. When Sebas is in charge of the group, they're called the Pleiades Six Stars, derived from a six-pointed star in astrology each representing one of the six combat maids. Yuri Alpha is second in command, and the chain of command after that proceeds down the line by order of age and Greek letter. It goes Lupus Regna Beta, Nabrila Gamma, Shizu Delta, Solution Epsilon, and finally Entoma Vasilla Zeta. As you may have heard before, Oriel Omega is the final sister and member of the Pleiades. When she's the one in command of the group, they're simply called the Pleiades Seven Sisters, named after the seven daughters of the Greek Titan Atlas. We've seen very little of her in the light novel so far, and all major references of her were cut entirely from the anime. But I'm sure eventually, Jin4 and I will get to making a video on her too. In any case, the sole duty of the Pleiades combat maids back in Yggdrasil was to serve as a final line of defense to buy Ainz and the surviving members of Ainz Ulgon time in order to gather and meet them in the throne room. As a group of level 60 or so NPCs and a single level 100 NPC, they had no chance of actually stopping any group of players who were capable of breaching the defenses of all floors of Nazarick, particularly one that could overcome these specialized defenses on the 8th floor. But as we've discussed earlier, the bulk of the guild NPCs in Nazarick were made for gimmick or roleplay purposes, and only a few levels were dedicated to NPCs who were actually intended to guard something. The combat maids were made with the excuse of being the last line of defense, but the real reason? It was probably because the guild members wanted an excuse to design some cute combat maids. But let's be honest though, can you blame them? Now before I get sidetracked and start talking about all the combat maids, we're here to talk about Sebas, not them. However, you know I can't do that yet because we first have to talk about his creator, Touch Me. If you remember from my Who is Pandora's Actor video, Touch Me was the former leader of Ein's Ulgon back when it was known as Nine's Own Goal. He was the one who brought the original guild together. What was not so thoroughly explained is why he acts the way that he does, as a shining example of a hero who helps others as if he's all might. You see, Touch Me idolized the concept of a hero character and valued virtues like righteousness, kindness, and honesty above all. His motto was simple, the strong should protect the weak. It wasn't a naive idealism either. Much like the paladin class archetype that he adopted, he believed in the fundamental importance of having the skills and strength to protect and enforce your moral view of the world. He was amazing at PvP with reflexes and mechanics that could not be matched, and with this strength, he protected the fledgling members of Ein's Ulgon from getting PK'd repeatedly, and built the guild into the global powerhouse that it would eventually become. He was by far the best PvPer in the guild, and among the top in the entire server, winning one of the world tournament championships held once per year by the server, and earning himself access to one of the restricted and highly exclusive world champion classes. 
Touch Me thus represents an interesting duality that's present in the Superman archetype. He is both a being of great power, but also a being who voluntarily and wholeheartedly sought to use his strength for the benefit of others and not himself. Perhaps it was his affinity for such tropes that led him to create the combat butler, Sebas Chan. Sebas is meant to be the archetype of all things butler, from his looks to his personality, even down to his name. Yes, when you put together his first and last name, you get Sebastian. It's a bit of a trope in anime, and Japanese media in general, that butlers are called Sebastian. The most well-known example, and quite possibly the trope starter, would be Black Butler's titular character, Sebastian Michaelis. But just to reinforce the point a bit more, there's a Sebastian in Penguin Musume Heart, Inukami, Five Brain Puzzle of God, Doki Doki Precure, as well as the video games Tekken, Soikoiden 3, and it Nier. Even parodies of this naming convention arose through shows like Lucky Star where butler type characters would be referred to as Sebastian even though that wasn't their real name. But as you can no doubt tell from these images, butlers in Japanese media usually have some combination of grey hair, a mustache, a black suit, and a fairly muscular build, if not all four at once. Sometimes the butlers are merely stewards for their charge, though occasionally they are combat butlers highly trained ex-military special operatives or mystic warriors of supernatural power who are hired to protect their charge from murder and violence, not just serve them lunch or chaperone them around. Honestly, the combat butler trope is even more widespread than the Sebastian name trope and can be found across the world. It actually stems from how the real-life British military used to work, so you know what that means. Let's briefly look into that with yet another Annie News history lesson. Back in the heyday of the British Empire, Commissioned officers in the British military routinely came from extremely rich families. After all, they were commissioned by the government to do important work for the crown, and such duties could only be given to trusted aristocrats from the ruling class, or so the logic went. As such, they would routinely be appointed soldiers to act as servants, or sometimes they would have their servants enlist as soldiers and be appointed to their command. It was so common, in fact, that the position of an officer's servant became permanent and actually survived all the way to the mid-20th century through World War II, even when the majority of officers stopped being royalty. In any case, these individuals would perform a variety of duties as both soldier and servant, including acting as a runner to relay orders, maintaining and cleaning their officer's uniform and equipment, acting as their personal bodyguard in combat, and so on. The position was usually seen as quite desirable and prestigious. This idea that butlers were frequently these badass, highly trained and competent ex-soldiers who enjoyed a friendly relationship with their master as a result of bonding during their military career became a popular subject of stories and fiction. Nowadays, most butler characters in fiction have an ex-military background of some sort. Prime example, Alfred Pennyworth. Japan, as they usually do, took this trope and ran with it. In Western countries, the butler may be a servant, but they're usually portrayed as a trusted confidant and friend. Japan tends to emphasize the notions of servitude more, whereas the West has historically valued individualism, freedom, and self-reliance. In Japan, as in many Asian countries, shifts towards such things have been slower because their culture values different traits. It's still customarily expected for those in the serving industry to patiently accept whatever orders or verbal abuse they receive from those that they are serving. Similarly, employees at a business aren't supposed to complain to their boss or protest difficult working conditions. Basically, Japan still values traditional notions of servitude from a cultural perspective. A servant, after all, is not supposed to have opinions, expectations, ego, or emotions. They're supposed to devote their effort and energy to serving the whims and ego of their master. It's no surprise then, the idea of maids and butlers took off in Japan and we saw the rise of things like maid cafes. Of course, it's not because everyone in Japan is a heartless monster or something, just because they don't like individualism and freedom. There's obviously something innately and intrinsically attractive about someone else working to benefit your well-being and happiness because they genuinely enjoy doing so, or at least they appear to. Like a mother's love for their young child, servants are supposed to have such a willingness to sacrifice their own happiness, well-being, and ego for their master that it almost appears to be like love. People naturally enjoy being the subject of others' attention and concern. The combat butler trope adds Gap Moe on top of this. There's something even more compelling about a dutiful servant who will do anything you ask for them without complaint and devote their entire life for you. 
but they can also take on a squad of a dozen ninjas while simultaneously preparing a cup of tea and scheduling your day for you. Japan already had the concept of the Yamato Nadeshiko, the traditional Japanese ideal for a woman, one that was gentle, patient, and servile to the men in her family, but also possessing a steel wit, wisdom, and the conviction needed to assist them during their toughest times, not just be a pretty wallflower. Combat butlers and combat maids are just the same concept, but with a western skin. Like I said, it's the Superman trope. Characters with great strength and competence who behave as if they were servants whose talents existed to help others. It was these kinds of characters that Touch Me liked the best, most likely leading to Sibas, who I'm sure I'll return to talking about specifically really soon. Though all of what I've just said about combat butlers basically applies to Sibas as well. He's not exactly an ex-soldier, but he is a badass warrior, so close enough. It's never really explained why Touch Me liked Combat Butler specifically, though we can infer that it was attributed to being a fan of the hero-servant concept. But honestly, it doesn't even need to be that complicated. You have to keep in mind that Nazarek's Supreme Ones, back when they played Yggdrasil, were for the most part gamers and otaku, in addition to being working class adults. People like Ulbert Elaine Odal or Tabula Smaragdina, who were interested in the occult and western mythology were the exception, rather than the rule. For the most part, members of Ainz Ulgon were influenced by anime tropes and Japanese culture, and they created things that reflected those influences, whether it be maids, traps, cute girls, or in Touchme's case, combat butlers. He didn't necessarily give him a fancy backstory, a unique name, or a complex personality, because of course not all people are interested in making complex, fully-fledged characters. As a matter of fact, apparently even his general facial features were modeled after his own appearance in real life. Put simply, he wanted to make something that would look like, act like, and think like an ordinary run-of-the-mill combat butler trope, serving his master faithfully and dutifully with a stern but gentle expression on his face. Why? Well, just like the reasons for many of the other NPC creations. It's because he thought it was cool. Really. You can see these same themes shared across the entirety of Nazarick. They're all rocking that combat servant theme. Generally, fiction writers tend to write what you know in the sense that they write the best when they're writing about what they're most interested in or speaking from personal experience or first-hand knowledge. The author of Overlord, Maruyama, wanted to write a story with Gat Moe, Combat Maids, Creepy Monsters, and Yandere Sakube. But rather than try and shoehorn in a lame excuse for all these things to appear in the story, he created a complex cast of characters who are otaku and had the justification be that they liked these things and they wrote it in their own story. It's a really clever way to lampshade the trope by openly acknowledging that half your characters were made specifically to be pandering to otaku fetish material. Okay, but seriously, let's talk about Sibas now. I didn't want to bore you about things you probably already knew, like what kind of character Sibas was. He's as stereotypical of a combat butler as they come. I figure it'd be more interesting to explain why he was written that way, both from the perspective of Touch Me who created the character and also from the author of the book. So let's talk about the aspects of Sibas' character that are a bit more subtle and a bit more interesting. Namely, the conflict that Sibas has between his nature as a servant of Nazarick and his nature as the creation of Touch Me. Sibas, like all creations of Nazarick, is a loyal servant who sees himself as having no other purpose in life than to do his creator's every bidding. But Sibas, like all other creations of Nazarick, adopts the personality of his creator in ways that aren't strongly defined in his lore, backstory, or game mechanics. Most of the denizens of Nazarick are evil aligned, and they view other creatures with at best complete apathy, and at worst, abject loathing and hatred, though a select few have a more neutral or pragmatic outlook. Sibes is one of the few Nazarick denizens who are known or strongly implied to be good aligned, alongside Yuri Alpha, Pistonia, and Negretto. In fact, he has the highest karma rating of any known denizen at 300. A good aligned karma rating typically indicates someone who will feel morally obligated to go out of their way to help innocents or strangers, and who find evil acts distasteful. Sebas actually takes this a step further, adopting the full lawful good archetype of the paladin his creator played as, meaning not only should the strong protect the weak, the strong should also punish and destroy evil, as he swiftly demonstrates during his ruthless purge of the Six Fingers. To Sebas, the conduct of many of these individuals, such as Constable Stefan, marked them as no better than animals or insects, and thus deserving of the same treatment as a rabid dog. Others, like the guards of the brothel or the Six Arms members, were complicit in those acts, 
and thus just as morally culpable. But more importantly, he found their hubris and self-confidence insufferable. It's as if he expects those with genuine power to maintain the same kind of humility and grace that he does and that his creator seemed to idolize, which is probably why he becomes good acquaintances with Klein and Brain. Ironically, Simas's righteous indignation and outright hatred for criminals and other scumbags whom he views as literally inhuman makes him surprisingly similar to the evil Nazarek denizens, in a sense. They too see those outside of Nazarek as fundamentally lesser creatures that do not deserve their lives, though the evil Nazarek NPCs are much less selective about who actually deserves what. That's not to say that they think everyone is beneath them. Regardless of karma rating, level, race, or position, a Nazarek denizen understands that their only job is to serve the edicts of the Supreme Ones, and that they are each deserving of a fundamental level of respect as fellow creations, for to disrespect a creation can be seen as a slight against their creator. Fundamentally speaking, the Supreme Ones exist at the top as the gods and rulers, with the NPCs at the bottom as their loyal servants and creations, and everything else that isn't from Nazarek aren't even on the scale. Nazarek servants share an affinity with each other, and view each other roughly as equals regardless of their position. After all, to think that one particular creation is fundamentally superior to another is to, in a sense, belittle one of the creators. Even a Claire, who seems to be made for the express purpose of being incompetent in every conceivable way, is not fundamentally a lesser creature because of this, though sometimes other NPCs do find it difficult to treat him with all due respect. Even if two creations would otherwise hate each other, both good and evil NPCs can cooperate to serve the Supreme Ones. For example, though Sibes can barely stand Demiurge's personality, he ultimately respects the fact that he can contribute to the glory of Ein's Ogon. And aside from uniting around their shared identity as fellow creations, some are even compelled by their specific lore settings or personal background to maintain relationships that may be contrary to their moral code. Look at Yuri Alpha. Though she finds the behavior of some of her more evil and sadistic sisters to be disappointing and exasperating, she still loves them, as they were all written to enjoy a healthy and respectful relationship with each other. Still, there are a few exceptions to this rule, such as Shaltir and Albedo's or Demiurge and Sibas's. No, the two of them don't actually fight, but they do regularly take low-key jabs at each other, and interact sarcastically and passive-aggressively sometimes. Part of the reason behind the conflict between Sibas and Demiurge is rooted in the conflict between their creators. After all, servants strongly take after their creators, both in the things they like and the things they can't stand. You'll recall that Touch Me was the kind of person who valued justice and righteousness. This frequently put him in conflict with Ulbert Elaine Odil, the creator of Demiurge who was obsessed with role-playing as a villain. The stark contrast between their personalities was part of the reason why Touch Me ultimately stepped down as the guild leader and appointed Momonga in his place. The two had argued so often and so emotionally that one of the founding members of Nine's own goal actually left the guild as a result, and there was this lingering sense of bad blood between the two of them that lasted for quite some time. Quite unlike the paladin class archetype that he played as, he wasn't a blind zealot and was capable of recognizing and acknowledging how his personality and actions had led to this conflict and had caused some of the very suffering that he wished to eradicate in the rest of the guild members. In any case, good-natured Nazarek servants still sometimes find faithful, diligent service to the Supreme Ones to be quite difficult to square with their sense of morality. Sebas found himself unable to resist saving Suare during the events of Season 2 despite knowing in the back of his mind that she was a potential risk and liability that could jeopardize his mission. He even took steps to conceal her existence by refusing to mention her as part of his regularly scheduled reports. He believed he would have been told to abandon her where he found her, and he just couldn't bring himself to do that. Deep down, he knew what he was doing could be seen as a potential betrayal that could put his mission at risk. But as soon as it became clear that the worst case scenario might come to pass, he decided almost immediately to accept the risks and consequences with the conviction to resolve any problems that arose, up to and including executing Suare on command. His greatest fear when being confronted by Ainz in Season 2 was not that Suare would be killed, but that he might be executed immediately upon presenting himself to Ainz, and forever be branded as this traitor to Nazarek long after he had passed. Nazarek denizens value loyalty to the creators and the Supreme Ones above all else, Sure, they'll find ways to do what they want if it still allows them to accomplish the orders that they've been given, and some of them may indulge in some willful delusion to do so. 
but betrayal is fundamentally only possible in the context of magical compulsion, such as in the case with Shaltir. So, with that being Sebas's lore, let's take a look now at how strong he is. How strong is Sebas? Sure, that's a great question, but I think the one that you want answered first is, what is Sebas? I mean, he looks like a human, but you and I both know that's not at all what he is. So let's answer that right now. Sebas is a dragonoid, as in a member of the dragon race in some capacity. It's possible he actually is a full-on dragon, but we'll get to that in a bit. Let's first look at the dragon race from where Overlord draws a lot of its inspiration, Dungeons and Dragons. Dragons are a fantasy race that come in two varieties. Metallic dragons that have, well, metallic scales, so platinum, gold, silver, or bronze, and they're typically heavily good aligned. Whereas chromatic dragons, deriving from the Greek word chroma, meaning color, were the opposite and strongly aligned with evil. Their scales had more ordinary colors of red, black, blue, or whatever, rather than the metallic sheen, and they typically defined what kind of breath they could spew, whether it be fire, ice, acid, lightning, and they'd be immune to damage from that specific element. Furthermore, dragons never die of old age. Instead, they grow perpetually. The older the dragon ages, the more powerful and larger they become. Physical strength and toughness increase along with their breath attack and how frequently that they can use it. They also gain a small selection of spells, including arguably their most important, the Polymorph spell, allowing them to change their appearance. Many of them tend to disguise themselves as one of the humanoid races, and even start families. Now, in Overlord, dragons are pretty much identical to their Dungeons & Dragons counterparts, but there are a few exceptions. First, the patterns of metallic being good and chromatic being evil doesn't quite seem to hold in Yggdrasil or the New World. Sure, there are dragons that are good and evil, but they seem to come in both variations of the colors. For instance, to the north of the kingdom lies the Argland Council State, where a group of five dragons, including the Platinum Dragonlord, peacefully rule over a nation of racially mixed demi-humans. Then there's the Catastrophe Dragonlord, so dangerous that he's described as being a world-shattering calamity. Another difference is their magic system. They have access to a powerful brand of magic called Ancient Magic, or Wild Magic, a type that's powered with soul energy rather than mana, meaning its usage usually requires the sacrifice of a living creature. Wild magic pre-existed the tier magic of Yggdrasil, and was the dominant magical art in the New World. Only those who had dragon blood somewhere in their lineage were capable of using wild magic, and the more pure blood of a dragon you were, the more powerful your wild magic. Thus, the eldest dragons, aka dragon lords, ruled the entire globe. But once the mana-based tier magic system was introduced into the New World, it became much more efficient to just use that instead. Though wild magic was said to be able to create effects that even tier magic could not hope to replicate. Of course, assuming that enough souls were sacrificed in the process. However, during this time, sixth tier magic was assumed to be impossible. So perhaps new world researchers didn't have a proper grasp on the full potential of tier magic. What we do know for sure is that the dragon lords who once ruled the new world with the power of wild magic were defeated by the eight greed kings and their tier magic primarily due to the efficiency reasons we mentioned earlier. Though few from the New World realize it, the eight Greed Kings were once players from Yggdrasil who were teleported to the New World in centuries past, much like Ainz himself. As a matter of fact, it's believed by many readers that players used one of the more powerful world items from Yggdrasil to allow inhabitants of the New World to use tier magic, since historically, the magic system had spontaneously appeared out of nowhere and wasn't native to the New World. But other than not being color sorted into karma groups and the slightly different magic systems, dragons in the New World are pretty similar to dragons in Dungeons and Dragons. Most importantly, with regards to the aspect in which they can polymorph themselves into any other race, and through this breed with members of various species, leaving behind whatever elf, dwarf, or any race babies with dragon blood in their veins. So what does all this have to do with Sebas? Well, either a lot or very little. Sebas is definitely a dragonoid of some variety, at least according to Shaltir, where she calls him Ryujin, roughly translating to dragon man or dragon person. So he's either a true dragon, a lesser subspecies of dragon, or a humanoid creature with dragon blood within him. And dragons did exist in Yggdrasil, so this isn't just some wild speculation. Dragons were actually some of the strongest enemies that one could encounter, and they were routinely used as world-class entities, 
basically end-game raid bosses, so powerful that they would require entire armies of max level players and NPCs just to take them down. The big question now then is, how much dragon blood does Sebas have within him? Keep in mind, that's Yggdrasil dragon blood, not New World dragon blood. Remember, they could very well not be the same thing. We know they have lots of similarities, but what we don't know definitely overshadows what we do know. So let's just encompass all of our potential possibilities regarding Sebas's relation to dragons. As we just mentioned, he could be a full-blown dragon just polymorphing into a human, a humanoid creature with dragon blood in his lineage, thus granting him dragon-like powers, or even some kind of lesser dragon species. Hell, he could even be a Dungeons and Dragons dragonborn for all we know. But as usual, we'll use a combination of logic and speculation in an attempt to figure out the truth. The name dragonoid carries the oid suffix, to mean like or resembling, but typically implies an incomplete or imperfect resemblance. Using this as our basis, the suffix therefore implies that Sebas is a lesser dragon, or dragon-like creature. And while that strongly implies a dragon subspecies, it could also mean a fairly young, true dragon as well. Still, I think it's safer to assume that he's a lesser species of dragon, and not just a true dragon polymorphed into a human. So let's proceed with that. As for being a mixed race with dragon blood flowing through them, well, that's certainly a possibility, considering that all Nazareth denizens were heteromorphic creatures, monsters with a vaguely humanoid feature set, if at all. A strong indication of what kind of race you are is usually how many levels that you put into it. As you may recall, heteromorphs have full access to a racial class tree that normal human and demi-human characters do not. If we look at Sebas's character sheet, we see his entire racial build is unknown, leaving 25 levels up for speculation. But trust me when I say it's Dragonoid. 25 levels smell suspiciously like either a heavy investment in a demi-human dragon blood racial class, or a moderate investment into some kind of heteromorphic dragon subspecies. But what kind of abilities does this Dragonoid race have? Well, we know of exactly one for sure. Sebas is one of a select few Nazarek NPCs who have the ability to transform into a final form. We have absolutely no idea what this form looks like or what powers it gives him, though it's presumed to be dragon related. It could be a full-on Skyrim dragon or just one of the aborted dragon fetuses from Dark Souls. But that's pretty much the only racial ability that we can confirm for him. I'm sure he has others, like some special attacks when in his final form, or even the stuff I discussed earlier could bear some relevance as in access to wild magic or some innate spellcasting and polymorphic abilities. A breath attack and inability to die from old age could very well be plausible too. Who knows? I certainly don't. But I'm sure you have a few ideas of your own too, so feel free to let me know. Anyway, what we do know more of is his classes and class-based abilities. Looking back on his character sheet, Sebas's character archetype is that of a monk, historically known as someone that practices monastic living at a monastery specifically someone who structures their entire life around rejecting material pleasure in favor of abstinence and minimalism, in order to pursue religious obligations and seek enlightenment. Monks exist within the faith traditions of various cultures, Buddhism, Jainism, even sects of Christianity. Chinese Buddhist monks have been stereotypically linked to the practice of Chinese martial arts, like Kung Fu, as some groups saw martial arts and self-mastery as a potential method of achieving enlightenment. It wasn't something that was particularly prevalent throughout history, or the entire world, but the idea of a bunch of priests who sat around praying all day but could also punch your lights out was apparently such a cool concept that it became a popular trope in fiction. Video games ran with the idea, and now the term monk is popular shorthand for a martial artist that incorporates Eastern spiritualism concepts into their martial arts. As a martial artist, Sebas is adept at fighting with his fist, or really any other limb for that matter. He doesn't need a blade to put a hole through your stomach. No, he can do that with the power of his fists alone. Now, aside from the 10 levels explicitly in Monk, he also has 10 levels in Martial Lord and a further 5 levels in Striker, a build that very clearly has a high focus in hand-to-hand -hand combat. While a strike can technically be done with any object, like a sword strike for instance, in the context of martial arts, certain attacks like punches and kicks are typically called strikes, in contrast to other moves like grabs, flips, or holds. The striker class thus may give Sibas access to different kinds of powerful strike moves, or just improve the damage of his strikes. 
Martial Lord, on the other hand, is a bit trickier. But in JRPGs, the word Lord is often used to signify an improved version of an existing thing. So perhaps it's a higher tier version of the monk or martial artist classes. Aside from regular old punches and kicks, monks themselves most likely have access to a selection of decidedly more supernatural abilities that are powered by the manipulation of key energy, a concept from Eastern spiritualism. Perhaps you're familiar with the terms life force, chakra, spirit energy, or nen. It's related to that sort of thing. It's the life force that exists both in oneself as well as the surrounding environment. Different from mana, and the way that mana is associated with the manipulation of physics and reality to create supernatural events, Ki is associated with vitality, health, and spirituality. Its manipulation grants control and mastery over one's soul, and by extension, their body. Basically, if mana is mind over matter, then Ki is spirit over body. This leads to a selection of spells or abilities that are radically different from a typical spellcaster. Ones that emphasize buffs and power-ups rather than overt flashiness and firepower. With that said, he actually has two classes related to key manipulation. One that's translated as either spiritual or inner key master, and one translated as either physical or outer key master. A common trope in Eastern spiritualism is that mastery over one's inner self, one's inner key or chakra, allows one to seemingly defy the laws of the physical world in many of the ways that a wizard can. You may see real life key masters walking on a bed of hot coal or surviving without food for months. But the term key and its themes of self-mastery and discipline also make frequent appearances in martial arts philosophy, allowing users to smash through bricks and the like. Fiction tends to take this one step further, where a master of key might be able to explode someone's face by striking their pressure points at specific angles with specific force, or shoot an energy blast from their hands, or even fly through the air. Basically, as an outer key master of 5 levels and an inner key master of 15, Sebas is adept at both manipulating his own key as well as affecting the key of others and in the natural environment. This could mean that his abilities are focused on self buffs while also having a specialized few that allow him to influence and control others and the environment. If I had to make an educated guess, I'd say inner key was useful in direct combat while outer key was used more for utility. As for his actual known abilities, he can harden his skin to make himself more durable using iron skin. He can channel his key into allies, allowing for the healing of basic wounds. Healing of more complex ailments like poisons or curses require a specific type of divine magic that Sibas doesn't have access to. He also bears a technique called Palm of the Puppeteer. It lets him control someone's mind by channeling his key into their head, though this can be negated with a sufficiently high resistance. Another ability is the one that he used on Climb to grant him the strength to overcome his body's normal limits while staring him down with lethal intent. Lethal intent being a gaze so murderous and intimidating that it sends shivers down your spine even if you can't actually see them. Sebas has so much control over his own body that he has precise command over his own lethal intent, resulting in an attack called Intimidation. As we saw in Season 2, he basically showers Climb in a lethal intent so strong that it gives Climb conscious control over his own reactions, teaching him in the process how to overcome another person's powerful killing intent through self-activation of his own adrenaline response in the form of a martial art. What happened here was essentially Sibas used an ability designed to debuff an enemy with fear and repurposed it to grant him another effect which is actually quite interesting, considering how much of the mechanics of Yggdrasil changed in the New World. From this, we can speculate that while Sibas may have only had access to whatever abilities that were part of his classes back in Yggdrasil, as a master of martial arts and manipulator of key energy in the New World, he may be able to accomplish things that he could not necessarily do in Yggdrasil, which makes you wonder what else is possible in the New World. But back to Key. Mechanically, it's not spelled out exactly how the manipulation of key is different from the expenditure of MP. Sebas's MP and magic attack stats are extremely low, suggesting that he has basically no spellcasting ability. But does key just function as a similar resource, going down whenever he casts monk's spells and regenerating slowly over time as one rests? Or is it a fixed value, like attack power, that determines the strength of his monk attacks? If I had to guess, it's a resource like mana, but one that can be regained much more quickly. 
like in League of Legends, how Lee Sin has an energy bar instead of a mana bar. High level monk abilities don't appear to be particularly powerful in the grand scheme of things, even in comparison to abilities from other warrior classes, let alone arcane spellcasters that stack all their stats into instant death. A good example would be Palm of the Puppeteer. It's a single target mind control ability that requires the user to physically touch the target. But a spellcaster can mind control entire groups of people from a distance with just the wave of their hand, just much less frequently. So it's most likely that key can be recovered quickly by stopping and charging up, allowing for more frequent use of lesser powerful abilities. In contrast to MP, which regenerates extremely slowly, but can be used for extremely powerful and impactful abilities. Under this model, a key user has no limit on how often that they can use their abilities, outside of drawing on their pool of key, only limited by how much key they have and how fast it can recharge. On a side note, there is a variation on the base monk class called Shaman, which we saw in the 6 Arms Leader Zero. Just like Sibas, he had levels in monk, but rather than being focused on the sub-variants of key mastery, he chose to specialize in shamanism. A practitioner of such has a body covered in the tattoos of animals, which can then be used to channel power from and imbue himself with features of the associated animal for a limited period of time. Knowing this, though I kind of implied that key energy is a feature shared by all monks, that isn't entirely true, as we've just seen with the case of monks channeling animal spirits instead of a key pool. Sure, they could be related, but it's hard to know for sure. Yggdrasil had hundreds of different classes, and they integrated all kinds of different video game archetypal classes and races under one big unified class system, much like how Dungeons & Dragons does. What I'm trying to say is that there could be different types of monks that don't necessarily draw from key or animal spirits, like Sibas and Zero do. There are many paths for a player to choose from and specialize into, all of which embody a specific type of monk. What probably unifies all monks together as a singular monk class is an emphasis of martial arts mixed with some brand of spiritualism. Now, after monk, Sibas has 30 more unknown class levels, most likely associated with monk or monk-like classes, which we won't try to speculate this time around. So now that we've covered his build, well, how strong is he? For starters, Sibas is one of Nazarick's four best close combat specialists, alongside Rubetto, Albedo, and Cocutus. This means he specializes in attacks delivered from extremely close range against opponents who are actively in combat with him. Unlike assassins who have to ambush opponents in order to maximize damage, as a CQC specialist, he is virtually guaranteed victory against anything other than a fellow CQC expert, given that he can close the distance and engage the foe at close range. When against a foe engaging him from outside of his effective range, he can try and weather the attacks with his respectable defense and high health pool, all while attempting to get closer. Sibas, I imagine, is much better at this than Albedo or Cocutus, as he is no less of a warrior, but has plenty of self-healing to keep his health up as he chases down a kiting enemy. As I've mentioned before, there's a rock-paper-scissors relationship to be observed with the other close combat specialists of Nazarick. Albedo beats Sibas, Sibas beats Cocutus, and Cocutus beats Albedo. So Sibas beats Cocutus, but loses to Albedo. Why? Well, Cocutus is highly focused on DPS with a glass cannon-like build, and Albedo is full tank. I suspect that Sibas as a monk has fairly well-balanced defense and offense. We know his punches are quite powerful, at least powerful enough to put him among the top three warrior classes in Nazareth. We also know that his defense is pretty good, but not quite as high as Albedo. He can also probably boost both offensive and defensive stats temporarily with his key. Combine all this with his mix of abilities to self-heal, debuff enemies, mind control low-level minions and whatnot, and you'll see he's got a very versatile kit that keeps him well-rounded, flexible, and balanced. Unlike the other two that are heavily specialized in either damage or defense. It's from this that you can piece together the dynamic. Cocutus has so much power he can overcome Albedo's defenses, dealing damage at a quick enough pace to down her before she can down him. Albedo is so tanky that Sibas can't really damage her enough before he runs out of key and has to recharge, whereas she can just slowly whittle him down with a flurry of constant attacks. And finally, Sibas has a good enough mix of offense, defense, self-healing, and special abilities to endure Cocutus's high damage output 
long enough to exploit his low defense. But there's still one really important thing that's not being taken into consideration here, and this completely changes the entire dynamic. Sebas's transformation ability. Like I said before, very little is known about its specific function. Except for one thing. It's apparently enough of a trump card that it grants him enough power to defeat both Cocutus and Albedo. So yeah, this has got to be some crazy Dragon-type transformation. That being said, it's likely limited in overall usability, such that he can only use it a limited number of times per day, possibly even just once. If so, an opponent who is aware of it can attempt to bait it out by retreating, then re-engaging Sivas when he no longer has access to his trump card. Or maybe it only activates when he's on low health. The activation requirements could really be anything, though Yggdrasil typically used the X uses per day model for anything that wasn't a spell and in turn didn't require the expenditure of mana. Incidentally, Sebas still doesn't become the strongest being in Nazarick when he's transformed. That spot is still held by Rubetto, being very capable of defeating Sebas even in his final form. I mean, Rubetto can likely beat Touch Me, the indisputably strongest member of Ayn's Orgon, who routinely beat Momonga, who had the skills and tactics to eke out a win on Sheltier, who is the most powerful floor guardian thanks to her min-maxed build and also capable of beating Kakutis, Albedo, and Sebas. Looking at it this way, then yeah, Sebas is unfortunately pretty far down on that power scale list. Still, he's a level 100 character like everyone else, and thus can probably face roll pretty much everything in the new world. I doubt that even a dragon lord can hold a candle to him. But yeah, that's Sibas, the dragonoid butler that excels in close quarters combat. I'm sure there's still plenty more things to learn about him, and I'm sure you all have some opinions of your own, so go ahead and let us know what you think about Sibas in the comments. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, Ciao!